everybody. My name is Julie Pomerantz and I am representing the Hub Houston today. Uh, the Hub Houston has several different programs. We're located in Northwest Houston. Um, we mostly serve those with neurodiverse differences. We have a school which serves ages 13 to 18. And then we have two young adult programs. One is held during the day, Monday through Friday, which is Life 101. And then we also have a nighttime social program called Club Hub. Um, so feel free to look us up on the website to learn more. Um, and it's the Hub Houston. Hub is H-U-B as in boy, which stands for heard, understood, believed in. Thank you, everyone. Hey, Jordan, you want to talk about Fusion? Sure, thank you. Thanks, Julie. Uh, my name is Jordan Nail. I'm the head of school at Fusion Academy in the Woodlands. We also have a location in Sugarland as well as downtown in the Galleria. Um, Fusion is a private one-to-one -one school uh, for middle school and high schoolers. Uh, we offer full-time services so students can actually graduate with Fusion, classes for credit, and uh, tutoring opportunities you know, after school tutoring. And I'm excited to be here. Great to have you. All right, Pam, it's yours. All righty. Hello, everybody. I'm Pam Esser. I'm director of Ada Southern Region, which is the Attention Deficit Disorders Association. Uh, we offer support groups and educational events. And I just put one in the chat. There's a link to our one on Saturday. Um, and uh, it's Chris Dendy, who's a really well-known author on ADHD, and she's going to be talking about transitioning um, from middle school into young adulthood. So check us out. Thanks. And that's a big leap from middle school to young adulthood. <laughs> no doubt about it. Well, I appreciate it. All right. I guess we'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to introduce uh, my assistant here. This is Miss Bridget Lewis. Hi, nice to meet y'all. And she's going to, she has got her bachelor's from a uh, Baylor in neuroscience and uh, has been working with her mother for years up in Dallas. Her mother, uh, Dr. Lewis, has a quite a prominent practice there in, um, what's the city up there? Plano. In Plano, Texas. So uh, we've got her down with us and she's doing some wonderful work. So she's going to get into the technical aspects of the, uh, the brain here. But let's go ahead and open it up. I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay, <clears throat> what today's presentation is on is understanding the brain, uh, the learning centers of the brain. I think this is really critical because uh, we have a lot of uh, methods out there to help children to uh, gain the ability to learn. I'm just trying to get the reasons for Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, we have a lot of systems out there in order to help children that are having learning issues. And I've, we've, I've been dealing with children with learning disabilities for about 20 some years now. It's, uh, it's quite prominent. But we're going to get into the specifics and maybe help you with uh, some understanding how the brain works and then what interventions we can possibly do. So we're going to talk about the primary learning centers in the brain, Wernicke's and Burkle's area. And then the Ms. Bridge is going to talk about encoding stories and retrieval. Uh, I'm going to talk about the brain's metronome and processing speed, kind of bring that together. And then she's going to finish up with disconnection syndrome and dyslexia. And, and her specialty is in Erlen because she has Erlen syndrome. Okay, <clears throat> key areas of learning in the brain are in the Wernicke's area and Broca's area. The left posterior temporal region, right behind your ear, is Wernicke's, so approximately the area of Wernicke's. And Boca's area is uh, in the left anterior temporal region. Now, this is uh, these are all on the left side. And you wonder why people who have stroke often um, or most often have um, issues with uh, language. Um, sometimes they lose the ability to speak or a lot of different things. And it's because most strokes do occur on the left side of the brain because the left side of the brain is a higher pressure side than the right side. So if something's going to have a potential for problem, it's going to be the left side. So just a little back, back door information on that. The reason it's a higher pressure side is because the uh, internal carotid artery on the left 
is straight into the brain. The internal <clears throat> carotid artery on the right has actually the brachial artery going off of it, um, feeding the brachial uh, arteries and in both arms. And it's the one that uh, is the lower pressure side. <clears throat> Okay, and here's where they're located. I just like this little simple picture of it just to kind of give you. So if we're looking at uh, on our doing neurofeedback, we either hit F7, which would be vocal stroke's area, or we hit Wernicke's area, which would be T, uh, T5. Okay, it's all yours. All right. I'm going to go ahead and talk about how um, we learn and better ways to encode and retrieve those memories. So we're going to start off by encoding. And I'm going to start off by talking about a, um, a little study that they did on cell phones and how they interrupt our encoding process. Uh, there was a study done where a professor had a cell phone ring. Right after the ring went off, um, he turned off the phone and then continued to tell the students some important information that was gonna be on the quiz. Right after they received the quiz, um, in repeated studies, it showed that the students who were in the room with the cell phone that went off actually did poorer on the quiz than the children who did not have a cell phone in the room before they were told the information for um, the quiz. Uh, I, I just think that's really interesting. Um, that it can mess with our encoding. Another way to help us encode things better is by uh, connecting uh, these new memories with memories that are already there. One method is the memory place method, loci. And you can do this by taking something that's extremely familiar to you, such as your house, maybe your route to work, um, and place these new memories in uh, in a room of your house or maybe by the one of the common stop signs that you, you pass on your way to work. Um, what this does is it gives you a place to go back to and in your head you can walk through your house and then retrieve those memories um, because you stored them in that room. Another way is uh, the self-reference effect. So taking something and making it uh, apply to you um, we have a greater chance of, of encoding that. Um, the generation effect, so this goes with studying. It is better for us to try and generate um, a response instead of doing um, ABCD uh, matching uh, when we're studying so we can encode that information better. Um, so that's that was really interesting well. Um, something that ties into what Dr. Ron was talking about is the Pura model. That is the um, hemispheric encoding and retrieval asymmetry model. This shows that encoding takes place on the left prefrontal cortex. Now we're going to go ahead and go to storage. So storage is just um, if you repeat same task over and over, your neurons will um, repeat that same, uh, what is it, release of neurotransmitters or uh, electrical signal. And that actually stimulates dend dendrite growth. It builds new connections in the brain. And this happens every single time we learn something new. Um, there's two types of memory consolidation. There's synaptic consolidation that takes minutes to occur. Um, and it's just the anatomical changes. They're right at the uh, neuron happening. Systems consolidation happens over time. This can take hours, weeks, or months. Um, and this is when that initial synaptic memory is distributed across the cortex to become like a, a long-term memory. Now retrieval. So are consolidated memories fixed? The answer is no. Every time we pull back up a memory, um, it has the ability to be changed. Um, another thing is according to the Hero model, we do retrieve information in our right prefrontal cortex. So very interesting. 
Um, tip of the tongue steak. I bet we've all been there. You think of something, can't remember it, the tip of your tongue. These are actually semantic information that has been encoded, but we cannot retrieve due to various things. We use our working memory to um, get help to, to um, retrieve these, this information. Things that actually help you in tip of the tongue states are gesturing. So if you ever find yourself in a tongue state, go ahead, make some movements, you might remember what this is about. Um, what improves retrieval? The testing effect. So if you're gonna take an exam, the best thing to prepare for that exam is to make an exam for yourself. Um, this goes along with test potentiated learning, which is if you're gonna take a multiple choice test, you should probably test yourself doing multiple choice. Whereas if you're doing a fill in the blank or spelling exam, um, you should probably practice filling in the blank or spelling out loud. Matching your encoding and retrieval. This aids in memory cueing, so you can um, bring up that and retrieve that memory again. Encoding specifies, oh, that's a hard word for me to say. That's matching up, um, yeah, matching, um, Yeah. <laughs> state dependent learning is when you maintain that internal mood or state that you're in when you're learning and when you're in your test site. This can have, um, there can be seen in individuals who have test anxiety. So they tend to study in a calm state and take their exam in a stress state, which causes them to struggle. Um, so I wouldn't. <laughs> ask them to study in a stressed state, but maybe learning how to be calm while they're taking that exam can help them retrieve the information better. Um, in regard to that, we're actually going to be talking about test anxiety in depth in our next uh, presentation, our next discussion in October, just to give you a little heads up. Transfer appropriate processing is matching the task. So again, that's if your quiz is going to be um, Multiple choice, make sure it's multiple choice that you're studying. Encoding specificity is matching your physical environment. So if you're gonna take an exam um, in an exam room, you should probably be studying in a room that's similar to that exam room. Um, so studying in your class or um, in an area that's gonna be similar so that's quiet. Uh, so not maybe in a library, um, or a, what, a public area. If you're gonna be taking your exam in a public area, then yeah, maybe you should practice taking your exam in a public area. So you shouldn't try um, studying at home with the music blaring away. Unless you're gonna take your test with the music, then it would help. But if you do study with music, um, unless you're taking a music test, I would probably, um, go towards not studying with music because it'll be more similar to your testing state. Okay, <clears throat> what we're gonna, what I'm gonna talk about now is uh, a very important brain wave called alpha. Alpha is somewhere between seven and 13 hertz. Um, and this is a nice little diagram of the alpha. And as you can see in the bottom of the pages, this is with the guy's eyes closed and it's, uh, uh, the back of his brain looks like it's making a pretty good alpha. He's got a little bit of excess in his temporal lobe. But this is, you know, what is alpha? Alpha is what I call the metronome of the brain. It's a, it provides a timing frequency. So as you can see on um, this number seven here, uh, as something happens, it goes throughout the entire brain. It looks synchronous. That's what you want to have is that synchronous. About alpha, alpha is a resting rhythm. It's the brain. The brain is in idle, basically. And so alpha rhythm is, is the longest studied brain oscillation that is, that is theorized to play a key role in cognition. They started originally when they started recording EEGs back in 1925, uh, almost 100 years ago now, the alpha was when the person had their eyes closed, the alpha was the dominant rhythm and it popped up and they said, oh, well, this is an easy one to study and it's pretty consistent. And so they started studying 
um, alpha. Like I said, the morphology, it's sinusoidal, it waxes, it wanes between 7 and 13 hertz. Now, this, uh, the hertz frequency that we're talking about here is the cycles per second that you have. And go back to this other one here, if you see, we, there's these, each one of these increments on the top are seconds, and you can count the actual peaks, and you can tell how fast the mouth is. All right. Additionally, the alpha rhythm coordinates activity throughout the entire brain. And so that's why I say it's a metronome. It's a coordinator. Uh, alpha starts out slow when we're very young uh, and increases in speed. And then when you hit about 65 or my age 68, it starts slowing down. It's like, I guess, the circle of life. And so that's why the first thing you see in those that are starting to have alpha start slowing in their brain as we age is they start getting irritated and frustrated with themselves because what they used to be able to remember, they can't bring uh, can't bring to light. They can't focus on it. They're dropping things. Uh, they're dropping uh, discussions all the time and forgetting where they are in, in, in the discussion. So, age of 12 is in the range of normal for alpha. And so, if we now that's uh, for it, depending upon the age, you can have an eight to nine hertz alpha in a six year old and be perfectly normal. If that's in a 20 year old, that's not normal. That's a little slow, but according to the ranges of normalcy for humans, it's 8 to 12 hertz. Faster is better to a certain point. Um, meaning, if you're pushing 11 to 12 hertz, and Jay Gunkelman, of those of you who know Jay, is pushing close to 15 hertz, which is extremely unusual. Um, and I say to a certain point because if you get too fast in your processing, um, fast brains think a lot. Especially, we see it in those young males that have fast brains. They really lack mental maturity to manage the thoughts because they're coming in so hard and heavy, and they seem to have such an astronomical impact on their uh, on their psyche, basically. Uh, so this is one, like I say, faster is better until a certain point, and then if you can manage it, great. It's like not everybody was intended to drive drive a Maserati. Uh, some people just don't like going fast, <laughs> um, but if you can handle it. You can really make that brain perform. It can't, the speed can be increased with neural feedbacks and or stimulants. Uh, stimulants increase alpha speed. Uh, primarily the one that does the best job on that would be the amphetamine class because it works more on norepinephrine, which speeds up the brain, than the uh, methamphetamine class, which then works more on dopamine to address another issue with the frontal midline scarring. But Neural feedback and stimulants both can increase this. And now we're looking at um, the possible uh, use of photomodulation in order to help uh, with uh, those, uh, at least the latest studies point for efficacy for using uh, photomodulation in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. So I'm really pushing hard for us over 65 uh, to try to have the best quality of life we possibly can. And if cancer doesn't get us, we sure don't want to have our brains start slowing down prematurely and, and not be able to work. I've got to have my brain to work, so I'm doing everything possible, and I will pass it on. Uh, traumatized individuals lose alpha. So if you um, experience an extreme trauma, uh, and there's only like 25% of the population will, uh, will end up with post-traumatic stress disorder, but regardless, once you've experienced extreme trauma, your brain can't take little alpha breaks. It's always on guard. It's always out there looking. You can't go into idle. And so this is some of the issues that we have with people who uh, have a tendency to smoke pot or do alcohol because um, alcohol will slow the fast brains down, but pot will create a slower alpha signal. And it does help them relax, but that's not the best way to self-medicate, in my opinion. And uh, just this last little note, alpha attenuates means gets smaller by two thirds when the eyes are open. So we, we know is that if it doesn't decrease when eyes are open, we've got another issue we need to look at as well. So disconnection. All righty, disconnection syndrome. This is also known as conduction aphasia. Um, if they have um, disconnect, it is where um, the Wernicke's and Broca's area are not um, connected by a white matter pathway known as the articulate, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, 
one. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Um, when there's a disconnect between what an individual wants to say and what they actually say, uh, that's when conduction issues happen. They're unable to repeat words, but they're still able to comprehend language. Now we're going to go on into Erlen syndrome. So I uh, guess I, I do have Erlen syndrome. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Um, but Erlen syndrome is a perceptual processing disorder has nothing to do with your eyes. Your magnocellular cells in your lateral nucleus, the thalamus, are thought to be involved with causing some of these issues of visual stress. Visual stress can be described as an inability to comfortably see without distortions. Um, so your symptoms are listed below. Uh, oh no, my little picture didn't show up right. Well, I, I made this, it has more things on here, but uh, there's usually an eye right here. Right here is your LGN. Um, and these are those magnocellular cells. They end up sending signals through B1 uh, to B2, um, perceiving motion, which is why visual distortions happen. Um, spectral overlays absorb part of the. You want to explain that? Spectral overlays. Mm -hmm. um, so these are. Uh, overlays made with additive color mixing. This decreases your exposure to a particular wavelength. Um, it differs with each individual who has Erlen syndrome. Um, so it is uh, made individualized for every person. Um, and that inhibits that wavelength from irritating those neuronal cells um, or perceiving that wavelength atypically. This treatment um, improves visual processing, light information, uh, allowing them to then apply strategies to decode meaning. Um, you can also use these for, uh, instead of like actual physical overlays to put over your, um, your screen or your pieces of paper. You can go get tested and get actual glasses um, that is a different color than your. Uh, in your sheet because it's at a different length from your eyes. Um, so it, it's, it's very interesting. Um, and then the prevalence of this is, is we know that 10 to 20% of the school population has reading difficulties. Within those individuals um, that have Erlen syndrome, 81 to 85% of them get that from their parents because one or both of their parents usually have symptoms. Uh, for me, my father has it, my mother doesn't. Uh, in addition to this, your siblings usually get it as well. My brother has it. Um, and so you, you see a high uh, incident rate in family. Now, the big question here is, okay, well, what's the difference between dyslexia? Well, dyslexia is a reading disorder characterized by difficulties with reading, writing, and spelling. The, they have deficits with their working memory, organization, sequencing, spoken language, and motor skills. Um, they can also have deficits in their audio, <laughs> auditory perception as well. Um, while with Erlen syndrome, people describe seeing letters move on the page. They see a blurring or a forming of strange patterns when they're looking at stuff. These distortions increase. Um, the more time is spent uh, seeing or the visually stressful thing, or um, if you have fluorescent lighting or glossy paper, which we all know in schools, they, there's a lot of fluorescent lighting. Um, Individuals with Erlen syndrome also have faulty depth perception. So night driving can be difficult. Um, so I actually do wear my colored overlay glasses when I drive at night. And they do look like sunglasses, but I see better when I have them on at night than when I don't. So uh, very interesting. One of the Erlen cases that I had years ago was a young boy that would get very nauseous mm -hmm. in school. And as soon as he would leave school, mother would come and pick him up, the nausea would go away. And um, and so this, you know, it ended up that he did have Erlen syndrome. We figured it out. He was um, during 
and it's probably I did have my lights on when we first came in before I started studying the model. And it was interesting to find how it does affect the brain. We actually were doing mm -hmm. live EEGs to see how the overlays made a change in the brain. And when we normalized the brain waves with a certain color, we knew we could lock into that color, which was kind of an interesting study. Um, and then if y'all have any other questions or want to check out my uh, blog, I have some more information there about Erlen syndrome, um, what it is, and any other questions. Yeah. And we'll load this PowerPoint up. Can we load the PowerPoint on the uh, chat? We can do that, but we can send out a link to the PowerPoint. Okay. okay, we can do that to everybody that's registered, that we have your emails on. We'll send this PowerPoint out. This information for you. All right, so <clears throat> now is the time. Let's open it up for questions. I'm going to stop the share because we've, we've spent our time and now we want to hear from you guys. Any questions about the brain, about the brain centers, about learning, about what we can do? Do we have any in the chat? Talk to us. Any questions? Julie, what is your experience over there at the hub uh, with learning issues? I know that's primary, primarily what you're facing a lot of. Thank you. Um, yes, what we, in our uh, programs, in all of our programs, uh, what we tend to do is to attract students, uh, or we call them members in our young adult program. Most of our members, not all, do happen to fall somewhere on the autism spectrum. Um, so anywhere from around moderate on the spectrum all the way up through high functioning. Um, but along with that, I would say in almost every case, what we're seeing is a lot of anxiety, really intense high in anxiety. That is it across the board. And then of course, um, other diagnoses that come into play are ADD, ADHD, of course, we see dyslexia, some depression. Um, so we're really dealing with a handful of diagnoses. Uh, but the magic here is that we keep our programs very small and the ratio very small. We typically don't have more than four persons at a time with a coach or a teacher so that we're able to give them all of the help and support that they need. You know, one thing I was gonna, I was about to write in the chat when you called on me, um, you know, we do have a couple of students that do have Tourette syndrome. Um, a couple of them are persons who stutter. Um, and so I was going to ask you if you could speak to those if possible, uh, to those diagnoses and their effects on the brain. They were talking about stuttering, and what was the other? Uh, the um, a Tourette's syndrome. Tourette's, okay. <clears throat> well, let's start out with Tourette's because we've actually published in this area as well. Um, Tourette's is a combination of ADHD, OCD, and a motor or vocal tick. Uh, you have to have the three to get the diagnosis of Tourette's. And Tourette's, it's theorized, uh, is having something to do with the very deep brain structure. Um, and the uh, claudate, the head of the claudate, they say uh, produces, if you have something going on with that, it produces motor tics and the tail of the claudate would produce uh, vocal tics. Uh, now these, this, whatever is going on with this part is theorized that it's likely a, a deep brain uh, electrical discharge called isolated electrolytic form discharge. It's like a, a spark that would light a seizure, although they may never get seizures, it's still, um, it, it still is bothering that part of the anatomy of the brain. And so one thing that we do find is that in those cases, uh, there's a lot of things that can make these Tourette's cases worse. What, what one would be stimulants, we know that, <laughs> uh, especially the amphetamine class stimulant, uh, because it makes the brain more excitatory. Now, you, you know the brain balance, a balance between uh, excitatory and relaxatory brain signature. So you need that nice balance. Um, a, high, uh, a keto diet improves all functioning and lessens, even in seizure disorder, it can be quite a bit to lessen uh, the seizure activity in kids. And so if you think of this as a, a mini silent seizure going on deep inside the brain, let's keep the blood sugar swings down to a minimum. And that, you know, that's the problem with taking stimulants because you lose your appetite and 
you're not eating breakfast, you're not eating lunch, and the brain just starts really malfunctioning and the ticks are a lot worse. Uh, sleep is another thing that really, uh, the, if you want to make the brain malfunction, just sleep deprived. I guarantee it will malfunction. Mine does that all the time. But uh, uh, so sleep is critical. So these are the things that will reduce the signs of stress. Now, we know as brains age, they they calm down, they settle down. The high amplitude becomes normal amplitude and they stop misfiring as much. And that's why you see the majority of uh, people that will um, develop epilepsy will develop it either at uh, infancy or at uh, when they go through puberty and maybe some at the young adulthood. But after that, you don't really develop epilepsy unless you have a tremendous head injury and you get some sort of uh, extreme lesion inside the brain that will trigger something like this. So brains do mature with age. Tourette's does eventually go away. Uh, at least most of it. Now, I have known one police officer that had Tourette's so badly that for some reason she would just, off the cuff, would just start cussing at people. Quite an interesting officer. <laughs> uh, we worked with her out of one of our substations when I was in Arlington, but uh, uh, that was one that did go on into adulthood, but I don't know anything more about her than it was quite an interesting case that all of a sudden these words would just start flying. And so, uh, so that's what we have with uh, that now articulation issues are in Broca's area, which are in the left anterior temporal region. And when we find uh, disruption in this on the EEG and the quantitative EEG brain mapping, we can actually go in there and help quite a bit to uh, rewire that part of the brain so that it's more efficient. And um, you know, for the for the kids that not only have stuttering, but for those that are pretty well nonverbal, um, we found that neurofeedback works phenomenally with these nonverbal children to give them language. And uh, it's, it's, it's almost miraculous. I still can't believe some of the cases when they do get language, uh, they really speed up their, the amount of uh, words that they can get in their vocabulary. It's just exponential. So that's the two things that I know about those two. Anything else? That's incredible. Helpful. Thank you so much. I, I'm going to tell some of these parents about that, sure. um, because especially with the stuttering, they're starting approximately around the age four, five, six, and it's just continued on. And um, on top of everything else they're dealing with, it's just such a struggle. So that's good news to hear. It Thank is. you. We can help them out for sure. Okay, what about uh, Jordan? Jordan, are you there? Yeah, yeah Jordan's uh, the head of uh, Fusion Academy, at least the one location she's at, and they do a lot of individual work. They also have a very small uh, uh, or very high teacher to uh, student ratio. So. Uh, Jordan, uh, would you like to talk about uh, anything you're seeing with your learning issues and their, your children? Unless you check down. Unless <laughs> you check down. Okay, let me see who else is on here. Dave Seaver. Uh, Dave Seaver is a guy from Canada who has a company. Uh, Dave, would you like to comment about learning issues? I know you've been, a, uh, with all your work you've done in this area for the past year, you probably have some interest. Uh, I guess I could add a few things about it. Um, certainly, as you know, uh, and you've already, uh, you know all this well already, but arousal, of course, affects uh, learning. And if arousal is low, there's attention issues. And if arousal is like in terms of like peak alpha frequency, uh, there's a racy head from no breaks in a sense in the brain. And if the arousal, and if the brain is too norepinephrine, it's running too fast and it's full of chatter. And in both cases, um, attention is impaired. And attention, of course, focus and attention are the first steps of actually inputting learning. The first stage is to learning. And if attention's gone, then the learning process will not take place. And as you mentioned, yeah, sleep is absolutely critical. I think that's probably the biggest thing we sleep or that we see. And I really should talk to you at some point about some research we've been doing on, on uh, what, what looks like post-inflammatory uh, <clears throat> shutting down of the thalamus. It's, it's probably based, it's probably uh, uh, glia based. 
And these low voltage, no alpha types, we've been, we've been uh, rebooting them with entrainment. I think it's working on lactate and ATP, but these people have severe sleep disorders and, and they can't uh, function at all until we get the sleep improved and then their learning goes way up after that point in time. Uh, does that help? Well, oh, that helps a lot. And especially in regard to the neuroinflammation, um, we're seeing this a lot in COVID brain. And now that a lot of um, children are getting COVID, I think we're going to be seeing more and more of this inflammatory process uh, that's going to be disrupting yeah. sleep. It's going to be causing all sorts of other issues. Uh, and anxiety and depression are high on the list. So for those of you guys who've worked with children or if you have your own kids and they go through something like COVID and get to the other side, be looking for uh, some sort of issues that are going on cognitively, uh, what we call a, in term now, uh, COVID brain fog, a good way to describe it. And this is, uh, this is going to severely hamper a lot of kids. Now, the, the, the newest thing that I've come across the newest hypothesis on neuroinflammation that would affect all of this is that, you know, for millions and millions of years, humans evolved where they were outside most of the time. And when you're outside most of the time, you get a lot of uh, the full spectrum of sunlight, which does include the 810 uh, nanometer, near infrared nanometer uh, uh, type of waves that could have helped take the acute inflammation, inflammatory process that is very good for healing, uh, but then keep it from becoming chronic and then starting a deterioration of your uh, faculties, basically. And so I think this is one thing that uh, the new technology, photomodulation technology that's out there for the brain is something that we could look uh, forward uh, to helping these uh, post-COVID uh, brain fog people um, get back to some sort of normalcy because then you get that frequency again. We can't spend that many hours out in the daylight anymore without ending up dying from skin cancer. <laughs> so <laughs> we're kind of stuck there because people were never uh, supposed to live that many years anyway. So the sun didn't really bother us back then. So it's just a hypothesis I'm yes. working on, but at least it seems to be uh, uh, the only reason I can make sense of why certain interventions will work. It's very difficult yes. to produce information with medication, we come to find out. Given that you and I have once lectured on uh, nutrition and the brain way back, way back when, uh, I'm sensitive to vitamin D. And if my vitamin D, vitamin D, you liberate serotonin. And if my vitamin D gets low as it starts doing in the fall, so I have to mount, monitor it pretty carefully. But I, I develop insomnia rapidly if my vitamin D is low. And three days of insomnia, you, man, you could have a giant, you know, letter in front of my face and ask me to remember it 20 minutes later, and I might not. I just shut down when my vitamin D gets off, but it's not so much the vitamin D, I don't think it's really the fact that the sleep gets thrown off. And, and when that does, it's bad. Another thing about vitamin D too, is there are studies showing that seizures are lowest in July and August, when people have best vitamin D levels in their brain. And another study that I've come across showing that uh, that most epileptics are deficient in vitamin D. And when they were given supplements and, and the vitamin D levels were monitored to optimum levels, seizure went down dramatically. I can see that uh, completely in the vitamin D. Uh, it's interesting when we go out in the sun, we're always wearing hats and we put on sunscreen and that will block the vitamin D from the sun, come to find out. So you're... <laughs> You know, you may, you may not get skin cancer, but you're, 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 you're trashing one of the vital um, vitamins that we need in our bodies for function. I've, rep I've researched vitamin D extensively, and, and there's hundreds of bad health consequences to not getting the sun that far, far outweigh the, the, the minimal risk of skin cancer. I think that's very true. And uh, so the more time we should spend out, we just had a hurricane come to Houston and we're it's uh, been gloomy three for days. <laughs> three days. It's like no sunshine. We're starting to feel like Seattle or something. Terrible up here. All right, Pam, did you have any uh, input on learning? I see you got your mic off. Huh? Let me put me back on there. Um, no, this has just been really interesting because I just think, you know, it just seems like we don't know where we're going if, with this COVID thing. And we don't know all the repercussions yet. So I'm, I'm taking notes and uh, 
very interesting because it just seems like um, our families, when I talk to them, are just they're just sort of in a fog whether they've had COVID or not. It just seems like a lot of our you know people are are de depressed. They're concerned. They feel like they're never going to get out of this. And I think it's just yeah, it's overwhelming everybody. I find that, you know, more people that I talk to are talking about, you know, that they're they're disorganized or they can't get anything done or, you know, and it's just, I, I think it's just been a real study in, uh, you know, resilience and how much people can take. And uh, it, it seems like every time we feel like we're getting ahead of this, it, it comes back. And then you add on the, you know, the hurricanes or Afghanistan or all those things that we've been. Um, I, I really worry a lot about our families with, uh, you know, dealing already with depression and anxiety um, and all of those things, because I, I just think it's a tough time and a lot of people are going to need a lot of help. So sounds like everything put together is going to make everybody present with more issues on attention and focus and mm -hmm. time management. It's hard to pay right attention. On. When you're stressed out, you can't really pay attention. And I think a lot of people that we know that aren't ADHD are still really struggling, which is- well, And the switch to online school has made it worse. I mean, yeah. for me personally, I don't think I would have been able to make it through high school if I had to do online. Mm -hmm. But yet here I am with a BS in neuroscience. <laughs> Yep, yep, yeah. you're right. Online school's hard. You have to have, you know, that drive to sit there and do it. You don't have other people giving you assignments. So. Yep, no doubt about it. Can you, you brought, put your um, your link up for your information on Erlene syndrome? I couldn't copy and paste it off of the slide, but I'd, I'd like to have it in chat because it does yeah. like, um, we like to send out about that every so often because people are just, um, you know, not aware of it. And it just, well, and I'm sure you know, so odd. Most people, there we go. Are, or I think it's like 40% of people who are diagnosed with ADHD have either Erlen syndrome two or have just Erlen syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it was very interesting to read that. And, you know, um, Yeah, I was going to comment on Pam when I've got a moment when you guys are done there on her comments. Go ahead, go ahead, Dave. Okay. Yeah, Pam, you brought up some actually some very good points. I mean, stress is devastating to the learning process uh, because uh, stress and anxiety shut down cerebral blood flow in the frontal lobes and prefrontal lobes where attention and reasoning and executive decision making all reside. So, uh, <clears throat> and, and the three symptoms of having shut down. Uh, uh, cerebral blood flow in the frontal lobes are high alpha, which is tied to ADD, but also all the symptoms of typically ADD or ADHD. And I've even observed that in doctoral students who are getting so stressed out, you know, in their final stages of getting their doctorate, they're, they're tapping their hands, they're twitching their legs, they can't pay attention anymore. They're, they're, they're struggling just to get through often the last six months of their degree because of the stress and becoming ADHD like from uh, having the super blood flow shut down. So all of this stuff, all these stresses, the news, um, man, if you can't handle the news, don't watch it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> it. It won't affect your life much anyway, except to make you uh, more stressed out and depressed <clears throat> and less able to function cognitively. And, and so uh, all those factors, yeah, definitely are, are plaguing us nowadays with so many things. And of course the news is really in the business of selling us emotion more than they are exactly. selling us information because mm -hmm. emotion will make us come back. And that's how they keep their subscribers, uh, their, their viewers up. And emotion also tears us up neurologically. Uh, so we got to be wise to that, yes. Uh, that's, awesome. uh, that's great, Dave, thank you for that. Uh, um, Stephanie, I saw that you joined us now. Would you like to say something about learning in your school? Hello. Sorry, I'm late, had a conflict. Um, I think whenever it comes to everything going on now, I think that one-on-one -on -one aspect has been a, probably the most beneficial whenever we've talked about learning loss and you know, 
uh, what somebody mentioned um, about going online, you know, just that's definitely something that we have seen um, has definitely affected our students. And that's why we have had a number of students join Fusion is because like they just need that kind of personal connection, that personal touch. And I think it's because people see it as a safe space as well, you know, whenever they go from their class one-on-one -on -one with their teacher and then they go into the homework cafe where they actually do their homework. It's, it's a chance for them to be kids, to relax, to do their homework, um, to play whenever it's appropriate, right? And then they can kind of go back and forth, but they get that, that eye contact, they get that personal connection, right? And I think that's lost um, virtually. And I think sometimes it's lost for the kids who really need that personal connection to thrive whenever they're in a bigger school or a different setting. You know, and so I think that kind of, I think we've seen that that shift or that change or parents have really responded to, um, to being able to make that one-on-one -on -one connection as they, as they kind of join. Um, sometimes they miss their friends and they wanna go back, but <laughs> um, whenever it's safe to do so, I think it's gonna be the key. Well, great, I think you're right. And I have seen some tremendous results from your, uh, from your students over there, they, uh, it's, you know, it, it's kind of equated in somewhat to a Montessori type approach. You know, it's, let's let them learn, let's teach them how to learn, let's don't teach them how to memorize. And I think that's very vital to our children nowadays. And I think helping them learn the best way for them, right? Like, I think because, because of traditional school settings, you just have to teach to the masses. Right, but I mean, whenever you talked about stress and anxiety, like we had a kiddo who came in for, um, she couldn't take a test, had severe test anxiety, which just shut down. Um, and so we're like, okay, well, let's, well, you really love art. So why, instead of your, instead of a biology test, why don't we use your art to demonstrate your knowledge, right? And so, um, so we then started that out that way. And of course, my first question in my head is like, okay, well, that's not going to work in a 400 um, auditorium, you know, student auditorium, whenever she goes to college, how is this going to work? Oh, we scaffolded her down. So let's kind of ease her into having to take a test. And whenever she took the test, she scored a 30 on the SAT. Like, okay. <laughs> All it took was that, that shift. And that little connection to just shifted a little bit and then she was able to perform. So just like your doctoral students, Dave, <laughs> you know, we were able to actually reach her where she was. And so that's really meaningful for the kids who need it. And Bridget, that was what you were talking about, uh, about, uh, I guess art is kind of like designing a room in your house and you, where are you going to put the storage? And so by her drawing it. Mm -hmm. She it, could go back to her drawing and still get that same information. She wouldn't lose it. That's a great way to do it. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, when I would rearrange my notes in college or take like a concept that was spread across the whole semester and make it into one photo, but draw something to connect them all together or make a, a chart that would connect everything together so I would have everything right there instead of over, you know, an overwhelming semester long of information. Um, so I could mentally go back and, and access it. And one of the things I think that I learned from going back to school later in life, because I finished my, I started my college career in 1972 and finished it in 2004. So I don't recommend that 34 year plan, but I had to become very efficient as a learner later on because I was just so busy. And I think that's where I learned my what I do best when I can write and be creative early. I can't do it late. I can do statistics late because it takes no brain space to do statistics for me. And I can do that while I'm watching TV. So it's it's then learning how your brain learns best. And everybody's a little bit different. What works for one may not work for the other. But we know that uh, in learning, uh, one of the things that I think is great about your uh, about fusion is that. You guys get most of your stuff done in, in fusion while they're, while they're there. And uh, the brain starts shutting down about six o'clock at night. So if you want to wait and 
study until six, seven, eight o'clock at night, you're already operating on a third less power than you were before. And pulling an all-nighter is just absolutely ridiculous because that won't work because you can't encode memories if you don't get sleep. Sleep encodes memories, correct? And it deletes them. Let's don't sleep for one more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's one less fight with with your kids, right? As a parent, like you're um, not kids <laughs> do though that their circadian rhythm does set back. Once they hit puberty, it pushes back their circadian rhythm to midnight. So they get tired around midnight. And so they should be going to sleep midnight to 10 a.m. Um, but we don't do that. Um, but it is known that uh, kids, when they hit puberty, their circadian rhythm does shift. So they actually do become more efficient at night. That is so And I know several people here are my professor in my uh, PhD program. His best hours were uh, 9.30 at night till 2 in the morning. Of course, that didn't work for me at all, but uh, it just is what it is. So everybody's got their own idiosyncrasies with learning. And I think that's another thing is to just have people, have your kids start learning what when they do better at what, and then try to apply that to their, their studies. And uh, But I do think the more they can get done, the less totally saturated they are with homework, the more learning occurs, not just memorization. Okay, anything else? Any other questions? Well, I, um, we're in the same room, so we have to coordinate our computers, but um, <laughs> I really appreciate everything that y'all have been saying and um, talking about, um, sorry, I'm turning my volume on so I can hear y'all if y'all talk, but um, we're right. having technical difficulties. I'm gonna have to meet one actually. Okay, so um, talking about how like stress affects the brain, which really ties into the topic we're gonna do next month on October the 20th, um, at the same time, 12, Wednesday, 12 to one, talking about anxiety's impact on testing and then um, how the brain um, works with anxiety and then also coping mechanisms that we can use to help our kids regulate their bodies whenever they're feeling stressed or anxious so that they can, um, you know, when, when they're, if you look at polyvagal theory and like the fight or flight response, um, whenever they feel unsafe or stressed, their prefrontal, prefrontal cortex will lock up. And so like, what are some skills that we can learn to unlock it? Like deep breathing or at the polyvagal theory, they say that you can help regulate your body with the, if you place an ice pack on your chest, um, and we'll talk more about that next time, but, um, we hope that you can join us next week. And if anyone has any last questions, we probably do have about five more minutes, but, um, I appreciate y'all for, um, attending the meeting today with us and then all of your input. And if you just remember to put your email in the chat, we're going to send out a recording. Um, we're going to upload it to YouTube and then we'll send out a recording for everyone. Can we ask a question to Dave real quickly? Um, Dave, I just wanted to ask you, you were talking about the shutting down um, of the thalamus and the severe sleep disorder and all of that. And I just wondered what your research or experience showed for people that do wear that sleep apnea machine. Where does that come into a play or does that have absolutely nothing to do with it? Yeah, it has nothing to do with the, the condition that I'm talking about. Although, of course, with sleep apnea, as you know, people are severely sleep deprived from waking up uh, 200 times a night. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm talking about is something that I've termed a thalamocortical disconnect, not dysrhythmia, that's a different thing. And, and, and it's a post-inflammatory condition. I have a 90-minute lecture video on YouTube about it. And uh, I've been researching that for quite a long time. And uh, basically, yeah, yeah, it looks like it looks like it's probably a, a, a glia mediated shutting down of lactate and ATP. And since glia mediate lactate and ATP, and that also regulates norepinephrine, there's a further shutdown of norepinephrine, and then a further shutdown of the calcium gradient, which is needed for synaptic transmission. But there's also other stuff going on about microglia eating synapses. I don't know how that plays out or not. But what we do see is that these are very low voltage people. I know that Ron has done some research on medication resistant people who are low voltage and they cannot make alpha. I put them in, in my, my brain lab, I put them into the most alpha inducing state. They're relaxed in a chair, they have a blanket, the room is dim, they have a white noise, a fan, a fan uh, running for white noise. 
And, and sometimes they'll make alpha in two or three sites, but the rest is pretty much low voltage and shut down. And sometimes they're shut down entirely. Uh, but they have the three common symptoms they have is uh, like symptomatically a severe generalized anxiety. They have severe insomnia and they also have an OCD. I always see the locus of their theta because they don't really make any alpha. I see it right down the cingulate in every single case. I don't call it true OCD. Uh, true OCD, we actually kind of see a misplaced alpha rhythm down the cingulate. These guys don't really have an alpha rhythm. So it shows up really as sort of a theta state that dominates right down the cingulate. And they're all hoarders, counters, cutters, ritualists, anorexics, and committed substance abusers, uh, every single case. And I'm not, I don't, I'm not really, I wasn't on here to try to promote entrainment at all, which is one of the technologies we work with. But entrainment often boots up that alpha rhythm, massive alpha waves in 15 to 20 minutes. And we're pretty sure the mechanism is, is lactate and ATP because entrainment has been shown to drive up lactate and ATP about 260% in five minutes. What's interesting about it is that alpha entrainment doesn't generally work at increasing their alpha. Uh, we're using randomized uh, SMR beta entrainment and it will drive up their alpha uh, 20 fold in often 20 minutes or so. Becky Basham is doing a lot of work with NFL football players and, and we're, we're co-writing a chapter in the next QEEG book on that. But um, yeah, so anyway, it's, it's uh, counterintuitive. And we see that whether it's chronic traumatic encephalopathy like in football players or whether it's Alzheimer's, it's really the exact same condition. And it's mostly mediated by the insomnia that is a, a result of having this signature. And if five to 10 years after the onset of that signature, they, they seem to come down with either Alzheimer's or CTE. And, it, and, it, and so far, you know, we've rebooted people who've been, uh, my worst case so far has been uh, 25 year, a person who was shut down for 25 years after an accident when he was six years old. And he couldn't function, couldn't do anything, couldn't hold a job. He was uh, an alcoholic and uh, lost his license. And... Uh, and uh, we, we, and he was the most severe case I've seen, and he's documented on my video as well. I had him fired up in about 20 minutes. We sent him home with a device that they use every morning when they wake up. Usually after about two months, you don't need it anymore. The brain is running fine on its own. And, and now he's a machinist. He's got a relationship. His life is turned around. He's alcohol-free for three years. Uh, we've got other motor vehicle accident clients who... At once they started using the entrainment, again, and I, I shouldn't really be talking about it because I'm hijacking that with my own personal stuff, but, um, uh, but uh, they, they went on two, year, two months after using entrainment. I got a really nice testimony from a lady, two, 20, she was shut down for 20 years after a car accident. And two months after using entrainment, she went back to college and she just sent me a really nice letter telling me that uh, she, she got her PhD. Well, you know, David, that's the uh, interesting thing about this is that, uh, you know, I was talking about the importance of alpha. And if you don't have that metronome, if you don't have that signal in the back and time everything to get where it needs to get, it, it's a perfect uh, representation of what I was trying to say. Alpha is critical and yeah. we lose it when we get traumatized. And so that's what we don't want to have happen. But I think we're about out of time. And um, if there's nothing more, we good. All right, so guys, we'll be posting this uh, video. I'm gonna stop.